quantum weirdness and God. First thing I'm going to tell you that is that I'm not going to tell you everything about quantum mechanics. There's no way we can get it done in the time we have. I will say that quantum mechanics is poorly named. There is no mechanics about it. There is no mechanism. Um, there is a break in the cause and effect chain that constitutes the universe. And the universe does not run by itself. That is to say there's something outside is a poor word, but uh, something different from foreign to the universe that is supplying not only novelty, which has been known for a long time, but also order from the outside. And we're also going to find out that consciousness is more fundamental than matter, which is a hotly disputed item in our culture. But uh, let me begin at the beginning. I'm not going to try to explain all about quantum mechanics, as I said. I'm just going to give you a brief history. I'm going to show you some experiments for which there's no good explanation in mechanical terms, nor does there look like there is one in the future. The uh, beginning starts with light going from the object seen to the eye. And this is most obvious. If you're in a dark cave, you can't see anything. There was a dispute in among the ancients as to whether when you saw something, the light proceeded from your eye to the thing seen, which was uh, kind of the natural way we tend to perceive it if we're not told otherwise. Um, but somewhat later, Newton proposed that light is particles. Now, I'm sure he's not the first one either, but something coming from the outside to you, and he proposed that they're little tiny bullet-like uh, particles that uh, went very, very fast, hit your eye. It explained most of the data. However, Newton knew that there was such a thing as Newton's rings. And so it's arguable that Newton didn't put all of his um, uh, belief into that particular model. Somewhat later, Thomas Young uh, claimed that light was not a particle, it was a wave, rather. And this was most obviously shown by interference, by the, what has been known as the double slit experiment, which we'll discuss in just a little bit. Um, the double slit experiment has light coming from a point source. And if you think of it as waves, the waves will hit both of the slits at about the same time. Those slits will act as new wave front generators, and those wave fronts will come down, sometimes reinforcing each other, which will give you a light spot, sometimes canceling each other, which gives you a dark area. And what you get is a series of bands that looks something like this. There's a number of different, uh, 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 if you want perfect bands, you have to have uh, a single color of light. Um, as a matter of fact, if you have multiple bands, they have some strange uh, uh, color patterns on the side bars. But the idea that it that it gives you several bands instead of two slits suggests that it isn't just bullets going through the slits, that somehow it's a wave front. And that idea kind of took uh, physics by storm. Light was waves. However, some strange things started to pop up at uh, about 1900, a little before Max Planck um, noted that light was emitted as if it came in small packets that were indivisible. Now, Max Planck thought this is probably just some kind of a mathematical trick. But the odd part was that Einstein noted in 1905 that uh, light was absorbed as if it came in little packets, quanta. And 
Finally, Arthur Compton noted that light scattered electrons as if it came in quanta. By this time, we're having some really weird stuff going on. The double slit experiment, light behaves like waves going through the two slits with interference fringes, but more strangely, electrons, which are indisputably particles, behave like waves going through two slits with the same kinds of interference fringes. And if you slow the electrons down so that only one electron at a time goes through, and this is something you can measure, you still get the interference fringes. So it's not a property of multiple electrons that somehow kind of bounce off of each other. Each individual electron follows that pattern. Now, this, the other strange part is when light or electrons hit the detectors on the screen, they behave like particles. Now, it's pretty obvious for an electron because it'll hit a phosphorescent um, screen and it will give a little flash where it hits. But it's also true for light because if you put silver chloride crystals behind the light, you wind up with individual silver chloride crystals getting hit by one photon and the entire silver crystal in a kind of a chain reaction turns into silver and chlorine. And uh, if you wash away the unused silver chloride, you wind up with photograph. That was the original photograph. So the silver crystals, silver chloride crystals act like they've been hit by a single particle. So where does the light change from being waves that get through the double slit to particles when they hit the detectors? The answer is nobody knows. If you send electrons through a very small hole, you'll get a pattern that looks something like this. Bullseye with a whole bunch of rings around it. If you send them through one or two at a time, you will get an airy pattern, but it's just simply more incomplete than the one over here. If you send electrons through one at a time, say one every second, so that there's no interference between electrons, they will give you that pattern if you put a photographic sheet up and leave it there for a week, that's the kind of pattern you get. How does light behave like waves in one place and then suddenly turn around and behave like particles? The airy pattern is characteristic of a wave. It's produced even if you have one electron per minute. You can go make that pattern as slow as you want. Where does the change come? Well, we don't really know where the change come from. And in fact, we find out that we cannot measure position and momentum simultaneously for any particle, no matter how hard we try. Is that just observational bias? That is, the particle is so small that every time we try to measure it, we hit it with something, and therefore it goes off in who knows what direction? Or is that something fundamental to the particles themselves, that they don't have more of a definite position and momentum than what we can give them? And uh, quantum mechanics kind of suggests the latter. There's uh, another part of quantum mechanics that's kind of weird. If you take a source of light and you shine it to a half-silvered mirror, you can split it so that half of it goes in one direction, the other half passes through the mirror. Then you can balance the two branches back together again, and if you put a half-silvered mirror in between, you get interference to where all of the light will go to one detector. This is true regardless of how intense your light is or how non-intense it is. It's called the ghost pathway experiment for reasons that will become obvious very shortly. The light beam is split by the half-silvered mirror. 
The beam interferes with itself at the end. If the beam is cut down to only one photon, it still interferes with itself at the second half-silvered mirror. One photon goes both ways. So does the photon go down one pathway or both? Well, physicists are inveterate ex uh, experimenters, so they thought, well, tell you what, let's put a detector in one half. So they did. Well, first, let's supposing you get four of these per minute at detector, at this detector. If you move this detector in there, you will now have two of them coming here, the other two going here, but the interesting thing is the interference is now lost, and so half of them will go to the detector at the top and half of them will go to the detector at the right. So you say, that's weird. How do they know that the other way is blocked? Well, let's move it back out of the way and sure enough all four of them go up to the top detector. So you move a detector into the other pathway. And again, you get two, detect two per minute here, which is about what you'd expect. But then you get one per minute here and one per minute here. Again, without the second pathway being open, you no longer get interference. So get that one out of the way. Well, tell you what, let's take this plate and just take it out of the way, this half-silvered mirror. When you do, uh, pardon me, when you do that, now you have two photons here and two photons there. No matter what happens, it will behave like it's a wave until you try to detect which part of the wave has the particle. As soon as you do that, it disappears. And these experiments can be scaled up as big as you want as long as you have um, an adequate uh, uh, visual pathway. Einstein realized that quantum mechanics spelled the end of the mechanical universe. Because there is no mechanism that will make that work. He tried hard to disprove Heisenberg's uncertainty principle, feeling this was one of the problems with mechanics. He and two other physicists proposed something called the EPR experiment. Einstein, Podolsky, and Rosen. This experiment depends on the idea of causation. And um, let me explain that. The cause always has to precede the effect in time or be simultaneous. But it has to be, you can't have a cause that, that produces something in the past. Nothing can travel faster than the speed of light, which means that if there are two events that are sufficiently separated by space, and sufficiently close in time, they are each in what is called each other's absolute elsewhere. That is to say, because light from one can't reach the other and light from the other can't reach the one, neither event can cause the other. And uh, if they did, we wouldn't be able to tell which one came first because according to special relativity, time uh, in that region is dependent on which way you uh, are traveling and how fast. So what you do is you send two photons in the opposite direction. Since they're traveling at the speed of light, they can't communicate with each other. If they did, they'd have to tra uh, communicate faster than the speed of light. But if you send them in the opposite directions, one will have polarization up and one will have polarization down, which because of the way light is working, that it registers as vertical in both instances. Or perhaps you'll measure it in the horizontal direction. One will be polarized horizontally and the other one will be polarized 
horizontally. So for example, if you checked a vertical uh, polarizer in one and a horizontal polarizer in the other, the vertical one will never get through. Even better, if you can separate them into vertical and horizontal polarizations, then you could say that one of them, uh, that both of them would be transmitted or both of them would be reflected from the polarizer regardless. So they couldn't have communicated with each other. They must have carried real information on polarization with them, said Einstein. You can't have that, you can't have it happen any other way. So what you do is you set up a, an, a light source with the proper optics to send it to your detectors, which your detector is actually a, a, a bunch of stacked plates. The uh, polarization in one direction is reflected and the polarization in the other directed direction is uh, allowed to pass through the, the plates. And so you can have, you can detect which one is vertically and which one is horizontally polarized. And if you run this, uh, run this experiment, you'll find that always the polarization of one particle will match the polarization of the other one, either transmitted or reflected. Now, that seems pretty obvious. They must have carried either vertical or horizontal polarization along with them, right? The problem that we have is, what happens if we rotate the polarization, uh, polarizers just a little bit? Well, if you rotate them a full 90 degrees, then all you've done is just switched everything around. And so now the transmitted will match the reflected and the reflected will transmit, match the transmitted. But what happens if you turn it, say, 25 degrees, 30 degrees, something like that? Well. At some angle, the polarizations would not match 25% of the time. Right now, let's say that we don't know what that angle should be um, because we're, we're dealing with um, hidden variables and we don't know how they're going to behave. But you know that there must be some angle at which they will match properly 25% of the time. Now, at twice that angle, according to what is now known as naive realism, 50% or less of the, of the photons should not match Bell's inequalities. Now let's, uh, pardon me, should not match, that's because of Bell's inequalities. Let me just illustrate that to you. Um, in the case where we haven't rotated anything, you'll notice that every time you have a right transmitted, you'll have a left transmitted, and every time you have a right reflected, you'll have a left reflected and so on all the way through. It's a perfect match. Now, if you turn it so that 25%, if you turn the left one so that 25% no longer match, then somewhere along here, in a random distribution, but enough to where you can get some pretty good statistics out of it, you're gonna have 25% that now, instead of being transmitted or reflected, or instead of being reflected or now transmitted. So if they're carrying this along with them, then if you rotate the left one first, then you rotate the right one, then there's this theoretical middle that would carry the same information as it did before, which we can't actually observe. But we can say that the right should disagree with it 25% of the time, and the left should disagree with it 25% of the time. Now, it's possible that the left and the right both disagree with the original, in which case we could get less than 50%. Maybe that won't happen, but 50% is the absolute maximum that you can get from turning the two detectors. Okay, well quantum theory says something different. It says that the number of mismatches should vary with the cosine squared of theta. 
which means that at 30 degrees, you're going to have a 25% mismatch. And at 60 degrees, you're going to have a 75% mismatch, which is just not possible by any kind of hidden variable that's carrying information both directions. Now, as you might have imagined, multiple experiments like this have been done, including changing which polarizer we're going to use while the photons are still in flight so that they can't possibly do this unless they have some kind of communication or unless there is somebody out there who is arranging things so that they match quantum mechanics. Um, and quantum theory has passed the test every single time with flying colors. It, uh, the curve is precisely what you'd expect from quantum mechanics. Which means that naive realism appears to be dead. Most physicists will assume that it is, in fact, dead. Novelty is coming into the universe from the outside. We've known that for a long time, you know. But more importantly, correlated novelty, that is to say, somebody that's making sure that things match, is coming into the universe from the outside. Which means the universe is not a closed system. There's something out there that is making sure that quantum mechanics works in spite of the fact that there's no mechanical way to make it work. Now, let's assume that there is something out there that makes it work. Whatever is outside the universe can act faster than the speed of light. It understands quantum mechanics. It's difficult to withhold the word God from that something. Now, let's go one step further. Let's supposing we say there is something out there that knows what's going on and it's making it work. If we agree that God runs quantum mechanics, because there's no mechanism for quantum mechanics to run itself, so there's something out there that's doing it, let's call that God. That means God is involved in all light. That is to say, you're seeing me, I'm seeing you. That's God at work. Furthermore, God is involved in all molecular bonding, because molecular bonds are quantum mechanical bonds. Finally, or no, not even finally, God is involved in all electron movements. When you're watching your television, well, not the new ones anyway, but the old ones, um, that were run by electrons striking phosphors, God was involved in that. In fact, God is involved in the behavior of atoms because one of the things we have found out is that atoms can be cooled to a point where you can stack them, not one on top of the other, but one in the same place as the other, up to millions of atoms. And there's no theoretical reason for not stacking billions of atoms into one spot. It's just a matter of how hard you try. That is, atoms, the entire atom is a quantum mechanical object. That doesn't leave much out. But that's just God running the show. What about, well, can't material be real? Well, there's, uh, besides Bell's inequalities, there's something called Leggett's inequalities. And Leggett's inequalities start out with, if you have five states the, of a single variable and you can transform from A1 to A2 to A3 to A4 to A5, and that variable has a range between minus one and one. We're going to define a function as a one time a one compared with a two, and a two compared with a three, and a three compared with a four, and a four compared with a five, and a five compared with a one. Well, when you do that circle, you find out that it's the, the answer to that is always greater than minus three. I'm going to give you an example where it is ex exactly minus three, and then you can I think you can see 
why it's difficult to get it lower than that. Of course, if they were all 1, then you'd have plus 5. But let's let a1 equal 1, and a2 equal minus 1, and a3 equal 1, and a4 equal minus 1, and then a5 can be any number you pick. 1 minus 1 doesn't matter. 0. So what you get is a1 times a2, which is minus 1, plus a2 times a3, which is minus 1, plus a3 times a4, which is minus 1, plus a4 times a5, which is minus x, plus a5 times a1, which is plus x. And of course, the x and minus x will cancel out. So it doesn't matter what you pick for a5. Um, with this setup, the lowest you can get is minus 3. Now, some enterprising physicists uh, have figured out that if you do an experiment just the right way, that the quantum mechanical expectation can be as low as minus 3.944, which is 5 minus uh, 4 times the square root of 5. So, of course, they've done this experiment. And first, a, a, uh, I, I guess I would say a simpler version uh, in 2007, um, and then a more complicated one. Uh, Anton Zeilinger is uh, the one who is really behind uh, as much of this as anybody. Um, a physicist from uh, Austria, works in Vienna, uh, works in the Canary Islands sometimes too, because it's a convenient place to work. Um, and um, their version of the Legacy inequality, because what they were using is A1 prime, which is actually, if you want to think of it as A6, is not quite equal to A1. Is um, they should get that 3.081. As you can see, it's very close to what you'd expect. So when they actually ran the results, they get 3. Point minus 3.893, which is clearly a violation of Leggett's inequality, and I'll let them give you their rationale. This represents a violation of inequality 3 by more than 120 standard deviations, demonstrating that no joint probability distribution is capable of describing our results. Elaine Aspect commenting on the first of those articles has some very interesting comments. Elaine Aspect himself was one of the first people to test the Bell inequalities by doing the einstein podolsky rosen experiments. But after Bell's discovery, the local realism entailed a limit on the correlations, a limit he expressed in his celebrated inequalities, a series of ever more ideal experiments, reference five and references therein, has led us to abandon the concept. It is then natural to raise the question of whether one should drop locality, which equates to the impossibility of any influence traveling faster than light, or rather drop the notion of physical reality. Following Leggett, they, he's referring to a Groh-Blatchler et al., conclude by questioning realism rather than locality, at variance with the often heard statement that quantum mechanics is non-local. Further on down, he says, I tend to accept the kind of non-local image sketched above as useful to stimulate my imagination, although I'm aware that it implies renouncing the kind of realism I would have liked. Notice this is, um, shall we say, an admission against interest. What kind of non-local image is he talking about? Consider, for instance, the experiment pictured in box one, which is your standard EPR experiment, and assume that a measurement is performed first on photon nu one. This measurement gives either a result of plus one or minus one. Immediately after one of the two results is con obtained, 
The quantum description of Nu2, which had not been favoring any precise polarization before the measurement on Nu1, collapses into a state of polarization identical to the one found for photon Nu1, from which one can readily derive the usual quantum mechanical EPR correlations. If we take this description, based on standard quantum mechanical calculations, as a model, it cannot be rejected by any experiment that is in agreement with quantum mechanics, including the more complex elliptical polarization measurements performed by Groblatchler et al. This model is clearly non-local in the relativistic sense, as we must invoke a particular frame of reference to give a sense to the statement that measurements on new one happen first and that its result immediately affects the state of new two. Does God have his own time frame? Can we say this model is realist? In a sense, yes, as we can qualify the individual polarization of each photon at each step. I must admit, however, that I am not comfortable with the notion of a physical reality that is instantaneously modified by something happening far away not to speak of the problems related to breaking down explicit relativistic covariance. In many of Einstein's writings, the no notion of a physical reality describing completely the state of a system localized in space-time is clearly linked to the relativi relativistic impossibility that this physical reality be instantaneously modified by a faraway event. To quote Einstein, the necessity of completing quantum mechanics in a local realist way could be escaped only by either assuming that the measurement of S1 telepathically uh, changes the real situation of S2, or denying the independent real situations to things which are spatially separated from each other. Both alternatives appear to me entirely unacceptable. It looks like the second one is the one we're going to have to go with. And uh, to quote uh, Richard uh, Con Henley and Stephen Palmquist, Henry is, uh, is in the Department of Physics and Astronomy at Johns Hopkins University. Elaine Aspect is the physicist who performed the key experiment that established that if you want a real universe, it must be non-local. Einstein's spooky action at a distance. Aspect comments on new work by his successor in conducting such experiments, Anton Zeilinger and his colleagues, who have now performed an experiment that suggests th that giving up the concept of locality is not sufficient to be consistent with quantum experiments unless certain intuitive features of realism are abandoned. Be clear what is going on here, he says. Quantum mechanics itself is not crying out for such experiments. Quantum mechanics is doing just fine, thank you, having performed flawlessly since inception. No, it is people whose cherished philosophical beliefs are being threatened that cry out for such experiments, exactly as Einstein used to do and with exactly the same hope, we think in vain, that quantum mechanics can be refined to the point where it requires, or at least allows, belief in the independent reality of the natural world it describes. Quantum mechanics makes no mention of reality, figure one, which I'll show you in a minute. Indeed, quantum mechanics proclaims we have no need of that hypothesis. Now we are beginning to see that quantum mechanics might actually exclude any possibility of mind-independent reality, and already does exclude any reality that resembles our usual concept of such, as he quotes aspect, it implies renouncing the kind of realism I would have liked. Non-local causality is a concept that never played any role in physics other than in rejection, action at a distance, which, by the way, was the chief complaint against uh, Newton's theory of gravitation. And one thing that uh, Einstein apparently solved at the same time he opened the can of worms for quantum mechanics. Um, until Aspect showed in 1981 that the alternative would be the abandonment of the cherished belief of mind in mind-independent reality. Suddenly, spooky action at a distance became the lesser of two evils in the minds of the materialists. There's figure one, for what it's worth. And uh, you will note 
that the many islands that are surrounded by zero probability valleys. Why do people cling with such ferocity to belief in a mind-independent reality? It is surely that because if there is no such reality, then ultimately, as far as we can know, mind alone exists. And if mind is not a product of real matter, but rather is the creator of the illusion of material reality, which has, in fact, despite the materialists, been known to be the case since the discovery of quantum mechanics in 1925, then a theistic view of our existence becomes the only rational alternative to solipsism. Think about that. Now, before we go too far, I think I have time to do this, so I'm going to try. Um, that's not it. It's worse because there we go. Okay. Um, yes, this should be it. I don't know if I can get this to work, but I'm going to try. Materialism was the view of many scientists at the turn of the 20th century. This simplistic view that all that existed was matter and energy, and the rearrangements of it, is the extreme view of realism. Realism is a general belief accepted by many today, that a physical reality exists independent of observation. And roughly 100 years ago, most held to one of these two views, rejecting the opposing view, idealism, the view that reality is a mental construct and doesn't exist independent of observation. For many back then, their understanding of physics seemed to favor this side of the spectrum, firmly believing it buried idealism. However, this realistic worldview was shaking with the advent of quantum mechanics. The realization of how the quantum world behaved began to eat away at the materialist and realist beliefs. Matter was thought to be tiny particles that existed independent of our observation. However, the equations of quantum mechanics and the results of the double slit experiment changed that. To understand what this experiment showed, a simple explanation is given. Subatomic particles were thought to exist like tiny bits of matter, not like continuous waves of energy. However, sending electrons through a double slit showed they acted like waves of energy instead of tiny bits of matter. Even sending one electron through at a time, the same result happened. However, when one set up a measuring device at one slit, the results changed, and the electrons acted as one would expect, as tiny bits and not spread out waves. When they observed, the electron went back to behaving like a little marble. It produced a pattern of two bands, not an interference pattern of many. The very act of measuring or observing which slit it went through meant it only went through one, not both. The electron decided to act differently, as though it was aware it was being watched. The conclusion was drawn that the very act of observing caused a wave function to collapse and create the existence of matter, either in the state of particles or as a wave. According to the Schrodinger equation, independent of observation, particles exist in a state of a wave function, which is a series of potentialities rather than actual objects. The very act of observing caused this wave of potentialities to collapse to a state of matter. The results inferred was that matter didn't exist independent of observation or measurement, flipping materialism up on its head. To better explain this, in The Quantum Enigma, Rosenblum and Kuttner explain with a simple scenario, representing what is actually happening. If you were to take an electron and isolate it in a superposition of two boxes, and open one box, the electron will collapse into either one or the other box. So if you don't see it in one, it will definitely exist in the other. However, if you were to take another pair of boxes and open both simultaneously, the electron would come out of both as a spread out wave. It would display the wave of potentialities as an actual spread out wave. The key to understanding what is happening is that matter doesn't exist as a wave of energy prior to observation, but as a wave of potentialities prior to observation. The waviness in a region is the probability of finding the object in a particular place. We must be careful, 
the waviness is not the probability of the object being in a particular place. There is a crucial difference here. The object was not there before you found it there. These were the conclusions drawn from the Schrodinger equation and the experimental results at the time. It was only reconfirmed in the 1960s by Klaus Jonsson. At that time though, not everyone liked the conclusion that was playing out. Some like Einstein and Schrodinger were deeply troubled by the results of quantum mechanics. So in 1935, Einstein and two of his colleagues proposed a thought experiment to debunk quantum mechanics. They proposed that if you place two particles in a joint superposition and then separated them by a great distance, an observation of one would instantly affect the other, which Einstein called a spooky action at a distance. The point was the observation of one couldn't affect the other instantly because information couldn't travel faster than the speed of light. If it did, then relativity would be violated, which didn't seem possible at the time. So instead, there must be some physical, undiscovered, local, hidden variable that was actually affecting them instead of our observation. That matter acted independent of observation and only appeared to be observer-dependent from our perspective. However, in the 1960s, John Bell began to explore this thought experiment and propose an inequality. If this inequality was shown to be false, then the local hidden variable theories would be debunked and matter would be dependent on observation. This was put to experimental test in 1982 by the physicist Alan Aspect, and the results confirmed Bell's prediction. Bell's inequality was violated. Einstein's spooky action at a distance was real. This confirmed what quantum mechanics was telling us. Prior to measurement, objects have no defined properties or location. The act of a conscious observer creates the existence of the physical objects and the properties they entail instantly. Who deserves to trust their intuition more than Einstein? And Einstein's intuition told him, like everybody's intuition tells them, that things are really there when you're not looking at them. Well, he was wrong, right? <laughs> you know, th that intuition is incorrect. But it doesn't end there, because many propose the existence of non-local hidden variables in Leggett's inequality. However, in 2007, they were also falsified, this time by Anton Zellinger and his team. The results sent shockwaves, and physics world went so far as to say this means quantum physics says goodbye to reality. So recent experiments led by a group at the University of Vienna, Austria, provide the most compelling evidence yet that there is no objective reality beyond what we observe. So it's really the observation that creates the reality. And what they found is that Leggett's inequality is violated as well as Bell's. Even if you allow for instantaneous influences, quantum measurements do not fit with the idea of an objective reality. So as they say in the magazine, rather than passively observing it, we in fact create reality. A reality independent of observation doesn't exist, but it doesn't stop here. Prior to this in 1999, the delayed choice quantum eraser experiment was performed. If I'm going to simplify and explain this complex experiment, we need to do so with a hypothetical scenario of modifying the original double slit experiment. Instead of placing the detector at the slit, it is placed past where the particles land. But just before the particles hit the film, it is pulled away and the camera captures the results after they went through the double slit. If they observe a wave, then particles went through the double slit as a wave, and just adding a measuring device doesn't cause them to collapse to particles. But if they collapse to a state of particles at the moment of detection, then even though they went through the slit unobserved and should produce a wave pattern, the very act of observing instantly transforms them into particles. But not only that, a back history is loaded up so that particles went through the double slit instead of a wave. Well, to the dismay of materialists, the results would display particles. Observation creates the existence of particles and loads up a back history so they went through the double slit as particles. Thus it follows particles do not exist unless there is an observer. But the problems don't end there for realists. Many try to explain this away and hold to naive realism, which holds to the belief that a reality exists independent of observation, just that our perceptions are just a representation of something that is actually there, but not a perfect representation. However, this view was also falsified in 2011, this time by confirming the Cochin Spectre theorem. The outcome observed reality depends on the measurements at the time and cannot be predicted prior to that, which would be essential for naive realism. The Cochin Spectre theorem talks about properties of one system only. So we know that we cannot, assume, to put it precisely, we know that it is wrong to assume that the features of a system which we observe in the measurement exist prior to the measurement. Not always, I mean in certain cases. So in a sense, uh, what we perceive as reality now depends on our earlier decision what to measure, mm -hmm. which is a very, very deep uh, message about, about the nature of reality and about our role in the universe. We are not just passive observers.
Then there was also the experiment in 2012, the non-local delayed choice quantum eraser experiment, and the results were quite astonishing. It concluded, no naive realistic picture is compatible with our results, because whether a quantum could be seen as showing particle or wave-like behavior would depend on a causally disconnected choice. It is therefore suggested to abandon such pictures altogether. Thus the conclusion is inescapable. This is why Eugene Wigner could safely say years ago that materialism is not compatible with quantum mechanics. And now with these recent experiments, we can also roll out versions of local realism and naive realism. Not only is materialism incompatible with quantum mechanics, but so is realism. As Zellinger said, we have to give up the idea of realism to a far greater extent than most physicists believe today. Now if one wishes to just dismiss all of this, I can simply refer you to the Quantum Randy Challenge, where you can win a Nobel Prize and prove naive realism or local realism is true and not observation dependent. Until then, to just dismiss all this science pointing in the opposite direction is nothing more than a faith-based opinion. Now many have tried to get around this by trying to separate the quantum world from the macro world, but that was also falsified in 2010 by violations of the legged guard inequality. And in 2011, Bruckner and Koffler showed that macro realism does emerge from quantum physics, so you cannot separate the two. This should be obvious since double slit experiments have been performed successfully with larger things like atoms or molecules. And experiments are being devised on how to do this with mid-sized proteins and viruses, and no one doubts the results will be different. Other elements of quantum weirdness have been seen in macro objects as well, such as quantum entanglement between two aluminum chips, big enough to be seen by the naked eye, and putting a small metal paddle in a quantum superposition. So the idea that we can escape by postulating the macro world is separate from the quantum world doesn't work either. The macro world is built by the quantum world. Another escape route many materialists use is to hold to the many world interpretations of quantum mechanics, which basically argues there is no collapse of the wave function upon measurement, but that every possibility splits off into different worlds. So every quantum probability actually does play out. They just split off into different worlds and in each one I'm observing each different outcome. But it is riddled with problems, unlike the idealist understanding, and it is an apparent violation of Occam's razor, as entities are not to be multiplied beyond necessity. Introducing a large number of worlds that we also cannot detect is an extreme violation of this, especially since this can be explained by accepting all these possibilities just exist in a mathematical probability as a wave function, instead of as actual worlds that can never be verified or falsified. An idealist understanding can explain this just fine with much less and other aspects of reality that we dealt with in our last video. The many worlds interpretation doesn't have enough explanatory power and has to postulate so much more in order to explain the little it can. As Bernard Hosch says, one tiny atom's quantum behavior replicates the entire universe and defines each alternative by all the possible consequences of that behavior. But at any moment within each human body, there are on the order of a billion times a billion times a billion atoms, each making quantum transitions. In the many worlds interpretation of quantum mechanics, every human being therefore creates a billion times a billion times a billion alternative universes every second. So this is absurd to postulate and unnecessary to do so. The last and important objection that may bring up is that this leads to solipsism, which is false. Solipsism for our purposes in this case would be the extreme skeptical version of idealism, which says only your mind exists and everything else is an illusion. But that doesn't have to be the case, as general forms of ontological idealism just say the appearance of the physical world is created by the activity of the mental world, not that only your mind exists. In a short article ranting about why materialists cling to false notions of an independent material reality, Richard Con Henry and Stephen Palmquist say, why do people cling with such ferocity to the belief in a mind independent reality? It is surely because if there is no such thing as reality, then ultimately, as far as we can know, mind alone exists. And if mind is not the product of real matter, but rather is the creator of the illusion of material reality, which has in fact, despite the materialists, been known to be the case since the discovery of quantum mechanics in 1925, then a theistic view of our existence becomes the only rational alternative to solipsism. And now I'll let Miki Ukaku explain why this is the case. Erwin Schrodinger, one of the founders of quantum mechanics, designed a thought experiment to drive home the strange rules of his theory. Let's say we put a cat and a vial of poison in a box. We add an atom of radioactive uranium and a Geiger counter. If the uranium decays, it sets off the Geiger counter, which then releases the poison and silently kills the cat. Before we open the box and look, 
We can't actually know whether the uranium has decayed or not, since radioactive decay is a probabilistic quantum event. Here's the question. Is the cat dead or alive? Well, according to quantum mechanics, the cat is neither dead nor alive, but the sum of the two states. Well, at that point, you say, well, that's nonsense. That's preposterous. How can you be both dead and alive simultaneously? Schrodinger's cat was supposed to show that nothing in this universe is certain until someone makes a measurement. But another pioneer of quantum mechanics, Eugene Wigner, believed it could teach us something else about the working of the universe. That consciousness controls everything. Bigner said, let's take it one step farther. If I, a human being, looks at the cat, I am conscious. Therefore, consciousness determines existence. At that point, Einstein went ballistic and said, what? You're saying that the fact that you are a conscious being determines the fact that the cat is alive? The answer is yes. And Bigner made one more step. And that is, how do I know I'm alive? You see, the cat and me, we're part of the same universe. If I don't know the cat is alive or dead, I could also be dead at the same time and not even know it. So who determines that I'm alive? Well, Bigner's fan looks at me, I look at the cat, and we exist. But then who looks at Bigner's friend? And there's an infinite chain of people looking at people, looking at people, until finally you hit cosmic consciousness. Some consciousness that's ethereal, that envelops the universe, which looks at us and says, aha, the cat is alive. I would even go as far to say that this position is more logical than the solipsist position. Because in this case, one can point out that our mind doesn't create reality. It only participates in it. In other words, we are not the architect or have the ability to change the structure of the world through mental processes. Remember the scenario set up in the quantum enigma about opening the box. If we decide to look in one box and find where the atom is, we do not actually decide where it will end up. We just use our free will to participate in deciding what the outcome will be, whether a wave or a particle result. But we don't get to choose the specifics. So the evidence suggests we are just lesser minds dependent on a much larger one that is actually in control of the structure of the experience. And we are allowed to operate and be able to participate in the outcome of the idealist experience. Now one objection to the theistic perspective is raised in the quantum enigma. If God is observing the physical world and us in it, then how come we can do experiments showing something unobserved is in a superposition? In other words, if God is looking down at everything, the strange rules of quantum mechanics should never have been verified, since they are always being observed by God. Well, this is a misunderstanding. God is not separate from us, someplace in space observing us, as space and matter are illusions of our conscious observation, as the falsification of realism shows. The existence of the physical world is created by our observation of it and it doesn't exist other than that. So what is there for God to observe other than what we see? Consciousness is what is fundamental, and our consciousness would be dependent on a larger one. God is in a sense observing us having an experience of the physical world. And apart from our experience, there is nothing that needs to be observed as it exists in the state of a wave function. So he is not separate from us as our consciousness is dependent on his, and he doesn't need to see an independent experience of the physical world. So thus we can conclude no other. Given the scientific evidence that has led us this far, what other inference does this lead to? Of course, one can always refuse to go with us to the logical conclusion, but that does not refute the conclusion or change it. Science has not buried God, it has revealed him, and with it buried materialism. It remains now only in the fantasy of materialists. Comments? Questions? Um, this whole predicament time. sounds to me very much like the predicament that Greeks found themselves in when they discovered that certain numbers are mm, irrational. Uh, only they didn't have that name for them. Um, 
There's a story that an oracle gave uh, some of the Greeks a puzzle when they went seeking for an answer. And the oracle says, when you can measure with the same ruler the circumference as well as the diameter of a circle, then you will find a solution to your problem. Unfortunately, there is no ruler that can give the same whole numbers for both the diameter and the circumference of a circle because there is a ratio in there and the ratio includes the irrational number pi which is non-repeating and infinite series of digits. And that was a huge problem at the time for the Greeks. We're now facing this kind of a problem. I suspect it is because we're lacking some theoretical understanding that would put all of these uh, conflicting views into their proper place. Very interesting discussion. Um, I wonder if possibly these folks are not tempted just a little bit into the God of the Gaps thing without having eliminated what we might call a more complex rational thing that we don't understand. Uh, creationists have been accused for centuries that whenever they have a problem that they can't solve, God did it. Uh, and uh, you know, we this has been embarrassing. And chemists used to say, well, only God can create organic molecules. And Wohler synthesized urea, and that was the end of that particular dictum. Uh, to me, the, the challenge here is uh, where do we stop look, looking for rational reasons and say, God did it, or does God act rationally? Are there physical factors that, I mean, could explain all these things if we just knew and we, we just have scratched the surface and atoms are extremely complex. Uh, the behavior of particles is extremely complex and we're just playing with superficial information. Uh, these are questions that this raises. Uh, but it, uh, it is sobering and it does tell us that our intellectual arrogance is really undeserved. We know very little. I would say this, that what little we do know does seem to point towards a uh, supreme consciousness. What, and what, what, is, what is really interesting... What do you mean by consciousness? Uh, thermostats have beliefs. Uh, do they have consciousness? And uh, not in the way I'm using it. <laughs> okay. Um, the the to me the the interesting thing is, um, I went and ran through Wikipedia while doing some of this just to see what they had to say, and also to you know get quick summaries of of stuff. And what was very interesting was that their take on this was, if I can put it this way, highly resistive. And I got the eerie parallel that they treat this the same way as they do the ENCODE information. What was highly resistant? I, mean, I missed your... They're, they're, what are they they're, highly resistant? What are they resisting? Well, they, they say, but this hasn't been proved. But there, here's this loophole and that loophole. They're desperately looking for ways to ignore what are the obvious conclusions. Mm -hmm. And 
it is exactly the same tone that you run into when you hear them discussing the ENCODE information, which suggests that much, maybe most of the, the human genome is actually functional in some way. Um, and I think from the same reason, they're fighting a, a very strong battle trying to keep materialism alive in spite of the evidence that we have. Because if materialism isn't right, then suddenly the, the ability to rule out God becomes, you know, becomes something that uh, uh, becomes very difficult. Um, if at base there isn't a material in the universe, if the material in the universe is being created as we speak, if it's a, a created background, then you can't create a theory that is dependent upon material and that uh, for which human minds are just um, uh, <coughs> fleeting phenomena that come and go and that don't really matter and, the, and the, the material is all there is really. You know, the, the kind of thing where Carl Sagan said the cosmos is all that is or was or ever will be. You can't do that. Something else mm -hmm. is all there is or was or ever will be and something else that apparently includes consciousness. Go ahead and then. Uh okay. Um, if we go with this axiom that observation creates reality, we talk about things like materialism. Um, how could that not apply to things like morality? Saying that our our moral observation makes that a moral reality. So aren't we kind of, is there a possibility this could kind of leak into subjectivism? Well, that all depends. If observation creates morality and there is no supreme observer, then I would agree. But if there is a supreme observer, then it implies that the supreme morality, in fact, comes from that supreme observer. So we're kind of stuck with the same situation that we are with, with dealing with evidence and biology and stuff like that. You know, if, if God exists, then that. If God doesn't exist, then this. And the same thing in regard to quantum mechanics. So we could actually argue from this axiom that observation creates reality. If God doesn't exist, then our moral observations are moral realities. That's so, right. Okay. But if God does exist, and you can see the logic by which one could argue that, that uh, God is almost demanded by quantum mechanics, then uh, that God actually knows what's moral, and it behooves us to pay attention to what he has to say. Is it a little bit of an overstatement then, or perhaps maybe Maybe uh, an overstatement that, that some are, are really kind of leaning toward more than, um, than some others. When we say reality uh, depends on observation, maybe we're speaking of it in a more limited sense because it sounds like we're dealing with some objective reality. Definitely. I mean, if we're talking about, um, like, for instance, the theism, I mean, that's uh, definitely not dependent on our observation. Uh, yes, and I think that that's one of the points is that, is that it, is not, it is not fair for us to say that reality is whatever we decide it's going to be. That is an inherently solipsistic view of, moral, of, of reality. By the way, it's also a solipsistic view of morality. 
But I think that solipsism isn't quite fair either because although we can set up experiments and have reality behave in entirely different ways depending on how we set up the experiment, we can't choose to make reality behave any way we want. So there is a sense in which, although perhaps matter is not fundamental, there is a reality that is outside of ourselves. It's just that that reality is set up by somebody else rather than being uh, a creation of m a myriad of uh, little tiny points that react to each other and react to fields and have no consciousness of what's going on. Which is that to say the rattling of atoms doesn't explain everything. But in a sense, God gives us a, a background against which we can act in a, in a field and, and understand what's going on and influence each other. Well, here's a silly question. If, if God got tired and stopped upholding the universe, would we fall over or would we cease to exist? I, uh, I think that one would have to say that we would just simply cease to exist. It wouldn't be a matter of falling over because the atoms would disappear too. And then if he started back up again, we wouldn't even know anything had happened, right? I would think so. I mean, that's a, that's a question that uh, requires an if that we, for all I know between when you gave the question and when, I answering it, when I'm answering it, the universe did stop and God went on to doing something else and then came back and restarted it. We would have no way of knowing. Uh, as long as the story is consistent, and that's not something that we can guarantee. You know, I guess one of the things it says is that we all exist through the grace of God, even those of us who are not saved at this point. Um, the Schrodinger's experiment is something that I've been puzzling over for some time. However, I, I just realized right now as we were discussing this that somehow the cat was ignored in the whole process other than the question of whether it is alive or dead. Does the cat have any influence on what's going on? Could the cat not meow or do anything to report its being alive? That I don't know, but if you substitute for the cat a person, and the person watches the radioactive isotope, right. there is Zeno's paradox, where according to quantum mechanics, if you observe continuously enough, the particle will not decay. Isn't that interesting? <laughs> <laughs> uh, that, uh, that just boggles my mind. How, you know, I thought radioactive decay was something that was absolutely fixed. If you watch it enough, it doesn't happen. It gives new meaning to a watched pot never boils. <laughs> We're dealing with stuff that's very difficult to understand. What it really sounds like is that we're in a, um, uh, I don't want to say computer generated, but God generated reality that uh, God isn't required to fill in all the details that all he has to do is fill in enough details to where we uh, uh, to where we see what uh, we need to see and that the rest of reality really you know in a way if a tree falls in a forest <laughs> and nobody's looking not only does the tree not make a sound, but it doesn't fall, and the forest doesn't even exist. <laughs> uh, the, oh, you know, yeah. I, you, you think this is crazy, 
Einstein used to say, I like to believe the moon isn't there even if I'm not looking at it. But these people will, uh, the Copenhagen explanation will tell you that the moon isn't there unless you look at it. That's the Copenhagen interpretation of quantum mechanics. <coughs> Paul, you've used the word weird here uh, as pertaining to things we don't understand. But can I come back to my simple childlike understanding of reality? There are things that, as a Christian, I have accepted because of faith. I believe before I eat my meal and I bow my head and thank God for the food, by my very action, I'm believing that electrons in my, in my skull are conveying a message to God wherever he may be at some vast distance away or maybe right and in another he, dimension, just... And in this, in this place on Sabbath mornings, we don't question the reality of those events. But by faith we believe them. So yes, weird, I'm not using that word about prayer. I just accept things that I don't understand. And when, uh, when all the disciples were in the upper room after the resurrection, puzzling about what to do, and the door was locked. But suddenly, suddenly, Jesus was among them. He simply materialized. Was that, was that a, uh, a collapse from the waveform to the particle form? I mean, we must be careful that we don't expect our physics to bring into understandable reality, you know, uh, something that makes sense to us. Our minds, I think, can't really expect to make everything sensible. When, oh, there's a, there's a Christian physicist, professor of physics in UC Merced. His name is Raymond Chow, and he himself has done experiments. He's a quantum physicist. Experiments he has done on teleportation, where information in one location can be teleported to another location, even past an impenetrable barrier. Is that what happened when Jesus materialized in the upper room? But these things have been actually validated by experiments in the lab and entanglement of some atomic particles uh, that are separated by vast distances can still affect one another instantly well beyond the speed of light. That has been verified many times now. So what we're dealing with <coughs> are things that are true even though they're way beyond our understanding and I have I appreciate your courage in opening up a whole domain of understanding which is, is fun to play with, but I'm willing to humbly accept uh, that my mind will never really understand it all. Hey, uh, thank you anyway. Nor, nor mine, for that matter. Uh, I think one of the important things that we can get out of this is that while we will probably never nail down truth entirely, uh, I suppose that we'll probably be chasing that uh, through eternity. Um, I think that there are times when we can at least dispense with certain kinds of falsehoods that tend to truncate truth. And I think <laughs> that materialism in the strict sense is one of them. That is to say, our observations actually influence whether a particular phenomenon is behaving in wave-like fashion or in particle-like fashion. And in ways that we can see behind it a consistent mathematical formulation, <coughs> but for which we can find absolutely no mechanical way of doing things. And I th think that that 
that tends to pull us out of the shortcut, which is what I consider it, of materialism. That the idea that, that all there are is atoms and the way they bounce off of each other and uh, their various <coughs> components is really an incomplete view of reality and one that can be shown to make predictions that are falsified as well as falsifiable. What you're saying, Paul, makes it really very simple for us to embrace the reality of miracles that are, that are dismissed by so many Newtonians around us. <laughs> yes, which in interestingly enough, were not dismissed by Newton himself. No. Because for him, gravity itself was a miracle. I love the story of Philip, who after baptizing the Ethiopian eunuch, suddenly found himself a long way away in Azotus. That was quite a trip, wasn't it? And uh, he must have been surprised to wake up suddenly in a, in a foreign place. Anyway, we're dealing with, <coughs> with wonderful things, but... Uh, I, I would uh, put in a plug for uh, materialism. Uh, the Zeno's paradox, to me, is a mathematical trick. You know, you, you say well, you never reach a certain point because you cut it in half and you, you're halfway there and you can keep on cutting in half and you can keep on cutting in half through till you'll, you'll never get that point because there's always another smaller half that you have to uh, reach, you know. But I know very well that I can get through that door. Uh, In fact, you're planning on it. And you got back through it uh, earlier this morning. Yes. And so, uh, you know, Zeno has to go out the window. No, and, and, and don't worry. The quantum Zeno paradox does not get rid of arrows hitting you. It tries to. What? It tries to. Well, it tries to, but, it, uh, but that, it doesn't fit there. But quantum Zeno is a little different. You actually observe a, a radioactive particle, and it won't decay. Sure, because your time gets shorter and shorter and shorter. Well, but, but the point of it is, even when you add up those times, it still doesn't decay when you expect it to. I, like you say, I, it's, it's weird to me, but the experiments are out there. So... Go ahead and then back. One of the interesting ones is back uh, in Isaiah where uh, an angel uh, brought this ember from uh, the uh, throne of God to him literally in three minutes' time. That's a little bit faster than the speed of light. That depends on where the throne of God is and exactly how it's located. <laughs> <laughs> I, don't think, I don't think the throne of God... Uh, has coordinates. <laughs> <laughs> I want to preface what I'm going to say by uh, stating a, a, a personal belief of mine that makes me sound like maybe I'm a, mater a materialist kind of. I believe everything's made out of something in terms of order, so I think that like you can break stuff down infinitely small, and you'll never find the smallest something. Uh, that being said, I also um, find compatible with that uh, a scriptural uh, belief. The, uh, you know, Colossians 1.17, God says, you know, well, you know, it, it says uh, uh, of Christ, and he is before all things, and by him all things consist. So I believe that even though I, you know, this, there's this infinite breakdown of small stuff, that on a fundamental level still, it is all composed of God's thought. The idea being that <coughs> perhaps uh, it doesn't uh, give the right impression when I say... Uh, uh, creation ex nihilo, because God didn't take some nothing and then form it into something, in my view, but rather he made reality out of um, the power of his thought. Um, so all, by him all things consist. So scripturally, I have an idea that um, really resonates with what I'm hearing here, but at the same time, I don't want to uh, 
jump wholeheartedly into something just because it, it meshes with something that I have as a theological belief. I, I, I want to maintain some caution, um, even though I'm, I'm very uh, intrigued. I, I think that's probably a good attitude for all of us. I, as you notice, I said, now, if we assume this and if we assume this, uh, we may have to backtrack on some of our assumptions because the fact of the matter is we don't know everything. Um, I like that it puts me in a comfortable <coughs> position. I particularly like it after having taken a beating from materialists for a long time. Um, but the fact that, that apparently we're winning right now doesn't guarantee anything. Uh, we may be surprised. Uh, of course, it is kind of fun to watch them squirm the same way that uh, we squirmed back mm -hmm. when they seemed to have the upper hand. Uh, and perhaps uh, one should maintain uh, just a little sympathy with them, because the whole world, uh, the whole worldview is being up to, uh, upturned, and they don't know where to go. I'm, I'm appreciative of this because uh, right now I'm in, I'm in seminary at a uh, um, at a place where there's a lot of, of opinions that aren't really, uh, uh, I would probably say, historically Adventist or maybe even Christian. And, um, you know, there's uh, some professors who believe that um, uh, God does not intervene with, with um, human affairs. In fact, they say that that would be against theodicy, it would be unfair. And it, it kind of amounts to deism in my view, you know, that like... The it world's does. out there independent of him, and he's not interfering. Um, and, and this, I, I think, might uh, uh, cause uh, some, some problems for their, uh, their systematic. I'm, I'm, kind of, uh, I'm kind of gratified by this. Well, well certainly, certainly, I think we need to be very careful about making dogmatic statements that God doesn't intervene, because it sure looks like he does. The whole thing sounds like uh, is rather dependent. It uh, doesn't stand on its own. Yeah. Uh, like I say, whatever it is that's intervening uh, can go through whatever walls you want to put up between the two events. It can uh, travel at the speed of light. Uh, I mean, this is just experiments that we've done, not the ones that are uh, conceptual. And the, the fact of the matter is quantum mechanics is the most successful in terms of its predictions uh, theory that's ever been made in physics. And there are a lot of people who feel that some version of quantum mechanics is in fact the truth, although we may be surprised at that too. And that's one of the reasons I'm not going to criticize the people who tested it. I think it's a great idea to test it, but so far it's surviving with flying colors and and the various versions of materialism seem to be having more and more problems as they go along. I'm ready to uh, uh, accept that uh, this is an interesting question, uh, but I'm not ready to say that there isn't a mechanistic explanation for quantum mechanics. Uh, just maybe a lack of information. Uh, didn't uh, I'm not sure. I get the, didn't Einstein ask Bohr if the moon is going behind the sun, it doesn't exist when you can't see it? Uh, I, well, I would say that he wouldn't ask it that way because most people know the moon would never go behind the sun in our standard. Uh, um, uh, Anyway, uh, you get the idea. Yeah. Uh, when you don't see something, it doesn't exist. I, I'm not yet ready to go that route. Well, I'll tell you what. Did you notice that in one of those it referred to a backstory being loaded up? Uh, I found that fascinating. And I don't know whether we'll do it soon, but eventually I'd like to go back to that and see if we can simplify the, the explanation of uh, the, 
the naturalistic way of looking at the experiment and the quantum mechanical way of looking at the experiment and what the results were and what they mean for loading up of backstories, which implies that your actions today can influence the past in a kind of weird way. It'll be very interesting to approach that. <laughs> <laughs> this is an intellectual game, and, you know, but uh, there's a reality there that uh, still I'm faced with every day uh, that, uh, you know, I'm not ready to give that up. Uh, I don't think any of us know the whole story. Who Just a minute. Do you have to thank for this melanin that you no, meet. Right well, welcome. is that if I do not observe it, is it still real? <laughs> well, but if somebody else is, if somebody else observes it, then it's real. Uh, you see, and the God has to mesh their reality with yours. <laughs> I would like to do an experiment. <laughs> it, it doesn't exist unless you eat it. <laughs> <laughs> 